Hello, and welcome to today's session of the Equity and Inclusion Speaker Series. This ongoing series aims to explore issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the School of Pharmacy and brainstorm ways to address these issues. Today's discussion will range from campus level anti-racist initiatives to actionable measures we can take today in our school. I am thrilled to introduce our guest speakers, Dr. Lamisha Hill and Tiffany Chan, both from the UCSF Office of Diversity and Outreach, or ODO. Dr. Lamisha Hill serves as the ODO's Director of Multicultural Affairs. She oversees the Multicultural Resource Center, which focuses on celebrating diversity, social justice initiatives, and membership for historically underrepresented learners. She leads ODO's diversity educational efforts, facilitating workshops and presentations across the UCSF community. Dr. Hill is also an assistant adjunct professor in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences. Tiffany Chan is the manager for the Anti-Racism Initiative at ODO. Prior to this role, she was the project manager at ODO supporting various DEI programs and initiatives, including the foundations of DEI training, advancing excellence in staff recruitment, chancellor awards for diversity and diversity and inclusion staff certificate program. She is currently a steering committee member for the American Pacific Asian System-Wide Alliance and the Asian Pacific Asian Islander Coalition at UCSF. Dr. Hill and Tiffany will, give, will first give us an overview of UCSF's anti-racism initiative. They will then lead a discussion about how each of us as individuals can grow and learn and provide advice on how we can all contribute to an anti-racist climate at UCSF. Before we begin the session, if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A window. The chat will be disabled and we will answer the questions at the end of the session. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hill and thank you to both of you for your contributions today. Thank you, Dr. Yeomans, and much appreciation to all that, who are attending, taking time out of your busy schedule and your noon lunch hour. I always get the lunch hour, uh, so holding attention is something that I'm pretty good at. It's a little bit difficult today because I can't see you all, but I am going to do my best to reach out to you across this virtual platform and connect. So I'm going to ask um, my colleague, Tiffany, if you want to go ahead and take yourself off on video and then we can also share the slides. Hello everyone, I'll be speaking with you more later and let me start the slide deck for us. Thank you, Tiffany. So in, in the spirit of giving honor and recognition, uh, one of the existing best practices and something that we are um, making an effort to implement and demonstrate and model here at UCSF is a land recognition. And so we wanna give um, honor recognition and acknowledge the Ramatush Ohlone people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to the Ramatush Ohlone elders, both past, present, and future, who call this place, the land that UCSF sits upon, their home. We are proud to continue their tradition of coming together and welcoming um, them and others in a joint effort to be more inclusive and respectful. We thank the Ramatish Ohlone community for their stewardship and support, and we look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. Thank you, Lamisha. Before we... Um start the presentation, we'd like to um, do a little bit of survey just to get your understanding of the topic of anti-racism and about the anti-racism initiative at UCSF. So I'm gonna switch gear a little bit and use the poll EV to get your answers. And the poll EV uh, link is on the uh, slide that I will show in just a second. So I'm gonna stop share.
Okay, so let's get started. If you can see at the very top, you can go to pollev.com slash Tiffany Chan. And that's how we answer. Um, that's how you can get your, put your response in. And the first question is, how well do you understand the term anti-racism? And we'd like to answer in a scale of one to five, one as sort of I only have heard about it and I don't know much to five is I am an expert knowledge in that term. Still moving. I'm going to give maybe another 10 to 15 more seconds for your answers. And then we'll move on to the next question, which is also the last question. All righty. Well, it looks like the majority is three. Oh, there's a little bit of shift. <laughs> Still hasn't changed much, but Lamisha, do you want? Do you have any comments about this? You know, I think we'll we'll get there, Tiffany, when we go through our <laughs> learning objectives. <laughs> so just remember, we are about. I understand that term well enough, and I'm still learning. Great to know. Good job, School yeah. Pharmacy. Next question, which will be the last question before we move into the presentation, and you can stay on the poll. Oh, you already got there. How much do you know about the anti-racism initiative? Okay, maybe another 10 more seconds before we stop this poll. All right, well, thank you very much for your answers. We're, good, we're happy to know where you're at and we hope that you'll learn a lot uh, from our presentation today. I'm gonna give it back to Lamisha. We have one more question that we may see from the poll that we'll ask towards the end of the presentation. Alicia, back to you. Thank you, Tiffany. So really the purpose of, of coming together and asking you all this um, is just with the acknowledgement that as a campus community, um, we have been doing a lot of work, particularly over the last 10 years uh, plus with the sort of the emerging presence of the Office of Diversity and Outreach. But we also recognize that in many ways we went from diversity, equity, inclusion, and a little bit of belonging. And then there was a, a shift, right, uh, into a new term uh, for many anti-racism. And so while we can break down the word with the context clues, um, I think it's also important and it's been important for me and also for Tiffany to, to recognize, wait a minute, like it's a, it's, a, it's a significant shift. And we wanna make sure that people understand what that shift is about, where it comes from um, and the heart and the essence of, of the word and how better to embody the practice. And so what we're gonna to do today is give you a little bit of a history and a background of how we got here with regards to our DEI initiatives and work. Tiffany's gonna to, going to be the expert for the day and go over specifically the anti-racism initiative. And then I wanna just have a conversation with you all about committing to change. And we'll leave a little bit of time for Q&A. So hopefully we can have some engaging uh, dialogue together. All right, so prior uh, to the Office of Diversity and Outreach, so which is sort of the, the, last, the last sort of um, element that you'll see on this timeline, uh, with regards to the history of diversity at UCSF, 
it is very, very important, uh, particularly that all of our staff um, and our community recognizes and understands the pivotal role that the Black Caucus played at, the UC at UCSF and the legacy of the UCSF janitor strike. And so back in 1968, uh, this sort of coincided with um, civil rights uh, efforts that were happening across the country. And despite uh, UCSF being in California, not positioned in the South, uh, policies and practices uh, still created many differential experiences for staff of color and particularly Black identified staff. They um, informally uh, dubbed themselves as the basement people. And this was because that while not under formal Jim Crow segregation, if a, if a Black or African-American staff member was serving food in the cafeteria and it was time for them to eat lunch at Moffitt Hall, and y'all have all been there, they had to go all the way down to the basement and eat their lunch. If they were cleaning any of the high level hospital floors, um, providing different support and services throughout the campus community, and they needed to use the restroom, they had to go all the way to the basement. So these individuals who were perhaps uh, not the most resourced financially, um, but were resourced uh, deeply, deeply well in resilience and spirit, came together and went on strike and advocated for change. And change not only for their own lived experiences and working conditions, but advocated for change that we continue to benefit from today. So we always wanna give honor and recognition to the janitor strike, the basement people, and the Black Caucus at UCSF, which actually became the first staff affinity group or staff group of color, and some other spaces they call these employee resource groups um, in all of the UC system. And from there, many other diversity act related activities uh, gave birth and gave rise. So as I mentioned, the Office of Diversity and Outreach was founded in 2010. And so what we can see is that there's absolutely many diversity initiatives, whether that was before the Black Caucus, uh, recognizing the, the critical and pivotal moment uh, that the janitor strike played, uh, but also with the legacy of the intersection between health equity, health disparities, um, and health ac access, UCSF has always played a role. If we think about the HIV AIDS epidemic and other uh, places where our, our physicians and our researchers and our staff community have gone above and beyond to create access to care. In terms of some of the more student facing work, just wanna acknowledge that the Multicultural Resource Center was established in 2012, 2013, uh, really out of direct student services, uh, direct student activism, direct student action. And I'm going to pivot back just one because I, I can't talk about the MRC without acknowledging my our sibling uh, resource center, which is the LGBT Resource Center, which office also sits within the Office of Diversity and Outreach. And the LGBT Resource Center is the first and oldest LGBT resource center in any health science institution. And for a long time before more community-based resources existed in San Francisco, uh, like the center uh, and all the amazing um, events that are there for the community, the LGBT Resource Center at UCSF paid to, served a pivotal role in providing access and support services for um, the LGBT community and allies in San Francisco proper. Now we're a little bit more institution facing, um, but that is something that we, we do wanna honor and recognize. So in terms of, of, of critical diversity events, I do wanna acknowledge that in uh, 2014, um, there was something really remarkable that happened uh, and that was the White Coats for Black Lives Dying. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. So Tiff, why don't we go ahead and move forward into some particular moments uh, in recent history. So as I mentioned, MRC was founded in 2012. And then in 2013, um, we had the, what I like to refer as to one of the first waves of particularly the movement for black lives or hashtag black lives matter, which was founded by Patrice Cullors, Alicia Garza and Opal Tometi. And their founding of, of this movement was really in response to the murders of Eric Gardner and Michael Brown and many others that went unrecognized, unnoticed and unaddressed. And so in this priv critical pivotal moment, um, it was sort of a, an awakening across the country. And I remember where I was uh, living in downtown Oakland at the time. 
And coming forward, uh, what occurred um, really, really quickly after that, it was our students who got together. And Tiff, I'm gonna ask you to, to advance the slide. They were the ones who got together to say, actually talking about justice for black lives, talking about the intersections of police violence and gun violence is actually a public health issue and not just a social justice issue and something that we actually should be engaging with here at UCSF. And so they organized um, under the umbrella White Coats for Black Lives and they hosted a die-in demonstration. And this is a photo from that event in 2014. And not only did they organize a critical movement here at UCSF, but they also organized over 80 medical schools across the country. Um, to come together and begin to further address um, the role that the health sciences plays in health justice and health advocacy. From the White Coats for Black Lives, Diane, it gave the opportunity and the creation and, the, and really the growth of the Differences Matter initiative. And so here, as the students shifted their attention, leadership also shifted their attention and we came together to say, okay, what, what can we be doing? Uh, we can do more. And so they launched the Differences Matter initiative within the School of Medicine and also partnered with the Office of Diversity and Outreach and many other campus departments to really create um, a, a more multifaceted approach and an initiative designed to address equity and inclusion across a number of different pillars throughout the system. And these are really, really critical and pivotal events. But as we know, what happened most recently with regards to 2020, COVID-19, and being in a place of sheltering in place while also things were happening across the world, particularly the murder of George Floyd, a rise in anti-Asian hate and violence, and disparities that were in it impacting um, morbidity and mortality rates across communities of color, particularly the BIPOC or Black Indigenous and other people of color. And so it's a critical moment if you think about it, I think about it oftentimes like a spiral staircase, right? So while we were here once in 2014 with the Movement for Black Lives, and it's the first time that um, really that phrase was, was echoed and the level of response and, um, I would say dissonance and difficulty holding and centering the need to address not only racism, but particularly anti-Black racism. And so the hope is, and I feel like in many ways what we've seen is that there's more of an acceptance to understand that we can do both and in the sense of spotlighting different communities, but we also have to recognize that there are critical events and themes that impact people differentially, and we can hold space for that too, right? And so from there, even though we were navigating a pandemic um, as a health science institution, and I just always want to acknowledge all of our colleagues who showed up, right, um, and put them themselves um, not only in harm's way, um, but also under just the, the probably one of the most significant amounts of stress that anyone could ever encounter, right, working through a pandemic. And, and I think people are still navigating the aftershocks and after effects. Um, but here we see, again, more solidarity and more recognition in terms of the demonstrations and the response to the second iteration of the Movement for Black Lives in 2020. And so all of that coming together uh, gave a secondary pivot. And one of the things that UCSF had the opportunity to do was host a presidential chair and scholar. And so Dr. Kamar Jones has been holding that role. She's a, a physician, a public health a change agent, uh, an all around dynamic um, change maker in the world. And in her work, she has brought um, more attention to the constructs of race and racism and how they're embedded systemically. And our campus community, along with Vice Chancellor Dr. Navarro and other leaders across the campus community, um, Thought, thought really fully about the need to pivot and to reground and recommit in the spirit of anti-racism. And so before we get to anti-racism, 
part of it is understanding what is racism. And so this is a definition offered by Dr. Jones that reads, racism is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks, which is what we call race, that unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, unfairly advantages other individuals and communities, and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And so perhaps if you have not heard the term before, race is indeed a social construct, uh, a very ancient practice, a very old practice that is deeply, deeply, deeply particularly embedded in our Western American context, right? And so the sorting and organizing of individuals based on their phenotypic characteristics, um, their skin tone, their complexion, other sort of visible characteristics, whether it's their eye color, um, the shape of their facial features, the location from, from perhaps where their ancestors have come from in the world, and the languages they speak, which does not honor actually ethnicity and heritage. It is a very, very archaic sorting and organizing, right? But not only does it happen on an individual or, or system basis, it gets embedded in policies and systems and practices, embedded in our legal system, embedded in opportunities. And so because in, in many ways, I strongly believe uh, we have not really come to a reckoning of addressing um, not only race, but racism. And so while we can move forward and try to fast forward to seeing people and trying to show up equitably, without addressing the harm and the ways that racism is embedded structurally, um, we will never quite be able to move fully forward. We would be tethered to these systems. Structural racism and oppression, thanks Tiffany for keeping me on track. Structural racism is a complex system by which racism is developed, maintained and protected, ultimately perpetuating racial and other forms of inequities. Again, public policy that looks like education, policing, criminal justice, housing, redlining. And so on the surface, you may be able to say, well, huh, I wonder why um, people of different communities are, are sort of clustered together or how things have emerged over time. And then we have rhetorics and dog whistles, right? They get to uh, the myth of meritocracy and the myth of the American dream. Structurally and legally, and even now, if we see um, the crisis that's happening in Eastern Europe and in the Ukraine, and the, I, I would say, appropriate and beautiful response uh, to support individuals who are, uh, are, are, are defined as refugees, right? However, that same level of demonstration has not been given to other individuals from other war-torn places who have ex experienced the same, if not um, other sort of parallels of violence in the world. And so it is to acknowledge that the policies that govern how people have access to care, life, liberty, freedom, and opportunity is deeply important. And I'll just say, because we're an institution, we are not exempt from this, right? So we can talk at a mile high level and look at the world and look at society, but really um, with regards to the intersection of COVID-19 and particularly anti-Black racism and other forms of racialized harm that have happened and that we have to attend to, it also is a requirement that we look at ourselves, right? We are a very large system, the second largest employer in San Francisco behind the city and county itself, and we are not exempt. We are not exempt from policies, practices, attitudes, and behaviors that differ differentially advantage or subjugate individuals. And so the anti-racism initiative was launched with the intention of centering the voices of black identified folks and other members of communities, I like to say resilient communities, um, so that we could better address the things that are often less visible, speak more intentionally to um, the efforts that we're trying to make and advance our conversations in a way that people can receive right, and reduce defensive, defensiveness. So I'm gonna pass it over to Tiffany, who's gonna talk through what exactly is the anti-racism initiative. Thanks, Lamisha. Um, I know based on the survey, a lot of you have known something about it, but not a whole lot. Um, and I'm here to provide all the details you need to know 
what the anti-racism uh, initiative is about as far as what we are doing at ODO, collaborating with many different um, partners um, and groups at UCSF to do the work to dismantle um, anti-Blackness, racism, discrimination. So um, we're talking about, you know, the initiative starting in 2020 after the tragic murder of George Floyd and what have we been doing to now? So I think the best way to show this is by showing you the timeline of things that happened. So starting from the very left on this slide, you'll see in June 2020, Chancellor Hoggood announces the anti-racism initiative at UCSF. And uh, right away, we got um, a town hall going for um, focusing on learners and some of their concerns. And if you look at all the bottom um, points, you can see we have had five town halls since August 2020 to address different populations at UCSF. We started with the learners in August 2020, and then we had a staff one on October 2020. In January 2021, we focused on faculty. And then we talked about the health system in March, 2021. Um, and I'll just stop from there and going back to September, 2020 to May, 2021, ODO, the leadership from the chancellor's office and different other leaders uh, supporting the initiative formed a planning group and to formulate what we call the pillars, identify the goals and the measures for each of the pillar. Fast forward, a year, about a year later, well, really a few months later, we are in August 2021, where we are able to present the final report of the pillars and go goals identified to the chancellor's cabinet, where we were able to secure funding to support the initiative. And then in September to October 2021, we formed a DEI Executive Leadership Council. And this council really, they meet quarterly to talk about the operation of the anti-racism initiative. And then finally, we provided some updates at the latest anti-racism town hall in December, 2021. So what is really, again, this anti-racism initiative really is about these seven pillars that were identified by the planning group. And the planning group um, in this seven pillars, we covered different parts of the initiative. And the first pillar, Pillar number one is at the very top, which is the climate. And it's we wanna ensure a climate that is healthy, safe and welcoming for all. And the second pillar is addressing anti-racism knowledge gaps. And then we talk about equity in decision-making process. We, adjust, we want to achieve demographic diversity in leadership, particularly to staff manager level three and higher. And we wanna achieve patient care equity further UCSF commitment to the Bay Area, which is really holding down the anchor institution work. And then finally, anti-racism and equity in research. And I will go through these in details um, so you get to know in terms of what are the works happening in these areas. So what are the, uh, what, how is this anti-racism um, initiative governed? And we have a governance, uh, governance model form where you can see we have starting at the chancellor executive team at the very top, working with Dr. Renee Navarro, the vice chancellor for diversity and outreach, our office, office of diversity and outreach, the cabinet members, leaders of the health equity council, the anchor institute initiative, chief of police, education dean, HR. And then finally, as I mentioned, the DEI executive leadership council, which are the functional and operational owners of the work in the pillars. And what they do is they really contributing the, um, the work by providing regular status about the pillars, talk about roadblocks, gaps, report on the successes. They advise Vice Chancellor Navarro, the Office of Diversity Outreach and other leaders in terms of metrics and the prioritization of the resources. And we adjust the areas of focus uh, for the upcoming uh, fiscal year. On the very left, you'll see in the circle, which is for CI, the, the Council on Climate, uh, camp, Campus Climate um, and Inclusion. And they focus on supporting the initiative as well by providing input and staying informed. 
As far as how we engage the um, community, as I mentioned before, we have the anti-racism town hall. And really, the focus of these town hall is to inform the communities uh, what's going on, find ways to engage our community members and help them take action uh, for anti-racism work and address any questions and feedback. Our Q&A session for the town halls are always really, really interesting. A lot of really good suggestions and feedback and how we can do better. So we highly recommend you to attend. And what we're hoping to do is we have one coming up on April 28th. It is not the anti-racism town hall, but the similar format, which is the Chancellor Leadership Forum on Diversity and Inclusion. You should all be receiving um, some sort of information through email very soon. And then in fall, we probably will do another anti-racism town hall to provide some updates on the initiative in October or November. So let's go into the details of the anti-racism initiative. So um, as I mentioned, pillar one, we are trying to create a healthy, safe, welcoming climate for employees, learners at UCSF. And if you look on the left, you'll see the objectives. Um, we're trying to enhance the safety programs. We are addressing racial injustices. We're raising awareness and wellness. And we're tracking and analyzing the climate regularly. And how are we doing that? On the right side, we have ongoing interventions. Uh, we're, we have the escalation programs and new safety officers in place right now. We're hiring a care advocate for racial justice. What is a care advocate? For those you may be familiar with a care advocate for sexual violence and sexual harassment, this person advocate for those who have experienced trauma, um, who needs navigation on the legal system, on the resources that we offer, and we're doing the same for those who have experience for discrimination and bias. You may know about the land acknowledgement that we, Lamisha just read, we have established that. And there's a website that I actually put on the Q&A um, that you may access to use that language as part of your meetings. We have Wellness Resource Hub and Community Wellbeings Grant established working with um, Campus Life Services um, in their wellness uh, programs. And of course, some of you may know and have participated in November was the climate survey. And what we're planning to do at the Office of Diversity Outreach and our partners is to launch this climate survey regularly and produce analysis to share with the community in terms of how we can do better in this pillar in creating a, safety, a safe and healthy climate for all. Moving on to pillar two, addressing anti-racism knowledge gaps. In the objectives, what we're trying to do is have a baseline knowledge and understanding of anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion topics. We are working with the education deans on revising and updating education curriculums. We are advancing DEI work in management and address anti-Black racism in science and medicine and healthcare. And some of the interventions um, that's been happening the last two years well, I hope all of you have taken the foundations of DEI training. And right now we have 32,000 people trained so far since January of last year. And we hope that if you haven't taken it, you will do it very soon. Um, the expansion of the training offerings, we have the DEI champion training through the Differences Matter program now is offered to staff and faculty from outside of School of Medicine. Um, Lamisha, and the resource centers are leading the diversity and inclusion certificate program. There's a general and an added on managers track. And then we have the anti-racism and equity curriculum in all professional schools and graduate division, which um, I know Sharon is lead, uh, leading some of that. And for uh, managers, um, learning and organizational development is it's launching a manager training that is required for about 2,500 managers all over UCSF on how to set DEI goals and create action plans. Finally, we are supporting the work of the repair project, which is really to address the last objective in anti-Black racism in science, medicine, and healthcare. In pillar three, we have um, the focus of how to embed equity as part of the decision-making process. 
And the objectives we have are review the leadership level decision-making bodies and processes, evaluate faculty advancement in decision processes, and leverage restorative justice mindset and practices in management. Some of the interventions um, that we have are, we, um, the chancellor's office had created a guidance on the composition of decision-making um, committees um, in, as far as the balance of having underrepresented uh, minorities as well as women at 50% or higher. You can read more about it at this link that I provided there. And um, you, we are also tracking the race and ethnicity and gender composition on the chancellor's leadership teams and committees. Um, as far as the faculty side, they have produced a standardized rubrics for assessing diversity contributions for advancement decision. And we are, um, the student affair offices is working with Maria Chao Chico on launching a restorative justice manager training series, which is, I believe, coming right now all the way to June. They're piloting this program. In Pillar 4, we're trying to uh, diversify our leadership, um, especially in the staff area in, and leaders um, for the faculty in manager level three and higher. The objective is really to expand the Advancing Excellent in Staff Recruitment Program. Some of you may know this program through um, different staff equity advisors that have recently uh, launched in last September and a diversity recruitment toolkit, which I'll talk more later on on the right side. And we are also trying to improve faculty diversity in hiring and leadership position as part of this pillar. We are reviewing participation in uh, diversity and high profile leadership development opportunities. And we're creating programs to ensure leadership development for underrepresented groups. As I mentioned in the uh, interventions, we have now six staff equity advisors uh, serving search committees in the manager three level and higher um, positions. And we also uh, office of diversity outreach together with human resources hired a diversity talent strategist that would lead the stewardship of leadership hiring. We launched an online staff toolkit for best practices in diversity recruitment and a hiring guide document both of these um, resources are available to everyone. For the faculty side, there's a lead toolkit to facilitate equitable and inclusive selection of diverse departmental faculty leaders. And there's ongoing review for leadership development programs by learning and organizational development. In pillar five, we're focusing on uh, patient care, especially uh, healthcare equity for patient and working with our affiliates, affiliates as well. In the objectives, we're trying to, re, we have reviewed and revised the policies that may have racist or have differential impact on specific population. And then as far as the health equity work, we identified and intervene and measure impact of health outcomes by race and ethnicity and support the work that addresses healthcare and patient equity. And the ongoing interventions have been, seven policies have been updated and the work group will continue to develop a work frame, uh, a framework for policy review. We are working closely with the Health Equity Council on some of these um, um, interventions and measures of health outcomes for Black, Latinx, and as well as Asian patients um, in our hospitals. There is the Black Health Initiative to engage, um, increase engagement with Black communities, and then also uh, the Oakland, uh, to Children's Hospital in Oakland, they have a DEI and anti-racism council formulated with a strategic plan. Oh, excuse me. Pillar six is further commitment to the Bay Area. And really the focus is to support the work of the UCSF Anchor Institution Initiative in the following categories specifically, workforce development, procurement and community investments. And some of the work that has is underway is increasing UCSF capacity to train, hire, and promote people from under-resources population. We're increasing the effectiveness of education pipeline for the under-resources population. This work is specifically under um, ODO's um, 
unit, which is the Center for Science Education and Outreach, led by Don Woodson. We are also working with procurement as far as giving more purchasing power to spend on small local businesses that are owned, uh, owned by or employed under resourced population. And the aim is 50% by 2024. And finally, we wanna establish a pilot investment program directing 5 million to social impact investments. Many of these are underway and we are working really hard to bring this to our communities beyond UCSF and in the San Francisco Bay Area. Finally, the last pillar, which is the pillar about research. And the goal is to make structural changes required to address equity and anti-racism for research endeavors at UCSF. And what this pillar is trying to do is to establish a system of accountability on anti-racism and equity for UCSF research enterprise. We're implementing and promoting a UCSF anti-racism scholarship creating and developing a more diverse UCSF research workforce and promote and support uh, community engaged research. And for these objectives, we there is a task force that was created to, um, to plan out these um, objectives, what needs to be, uh, what needs to establish and be implemented. And the task force on research equity and anti-racism reported um, their executive level outcomes with a report that I believe you should be able to find in our anti-racism uh, initiative website. There is also a hiring of an inaugural associated vice chancellor for research, DEI and anti-racism focus. Right now, there are two anti-racism research grants to support capacity building projects and research projects addressing anti-Black racism. And finally, the Academy of Medical Education Internal Risk and Anti-Racism Research grant, Grants have been funded. So we're really excited for all the different work that's been happening the last two years um, since the launch of the Anti-Racism Initiative. But of course, this is not the end. And to see more in details of some of the um, anti-racism initiative outcomes, it is available in the UCSF, um, in our, the Office of Diversity Outreach annual report that just came out. And the link is right here and you can read more in details, see different numbers as well as other work that ODO is doing to support diversity, equity, inclusion and the mission of UCSF. UCSF. So what's next for us? Well, in 2020, um, actually it started back in 2021, um, the start of the fiscal year, we've been working with Dr. Kamara Jones, the UCSF presidential chair for this year on um, the anti-racism initiative and her work on the anti-racism collaborative framework. If you know about her work, I think one of the most interesting um, aspect is that she breaks it down where it's operate can be operationalized. As you can see, Dr. Jones's anti-racism collaborative framework has three parts. One is naming racism. The second one is asking how is racism operating here, which really addresses the mechanism of racism in structures, policies, practices, norms, and values. And then finally, once we sort of understand how racism is operating here, there is a collective action teams that we can formulate to move forward with the work and dismantle racism. So what Dr. Jones has been doing is that um, she's been touring around um, UCSF virtually, uh, and she's been talking with many of our partners, collaborators on the work of anti-racism DEI. And she's actually eight months in, so she's towards almost the end of it. And what she's hoping to do at the end of this um, chairship is that she will want to produce a product to summarize sort of her observation and make recommendations and, and hope that the anti-racism initiative will be generational, more uh, inclusive and more cohesive um, in the next 10 to 20 years to come. So this is our sort of moving into the next phase of the anti-racism initiative. We're looking into what the pillar's about. Is it inclusive enough? Is everyone on the table that needs to be involved? And how do we expand our operation, furthering our infrastructure 
uh, in this anti-racism initiative. So I will wrap up right here and give it back to Lamisha in terms of how you can get involved more and in committing to anti-racism initiative at UCSF. Thanks, Tiff. Um, and if you can do me a favor, you can just drop the slides. I, I'm going to go a little off script um, because the there are some important comments in the chat that I want to address um, before going into what I believe to be both individual and collective um, opportunities and responsibilities to contributing to change. So I'll start with, with some of those questions because I don't want the, the chat to get a little overwhelming, um, but we can have a discussion. And, and again, I apologize because we're not really in a position to um, put ourselves um, all on screen and to have a collective dialogue, but I hope it's the start of, of more to come. Um, so the question, there's, there's two sort of first questions just about uh, the connection to indigenous communities. And the first question is about um, rematriation of land, and I'll say it that way. There are um, dialogues about um, not only rematriation in California broadly, but also specifically here at UCSF as it, as it pertains to Mount Sutro. Um, there are individuals that are collectively um, building relationships with the elders of the Ramatish Ohlone people, um, both formally and informally at UCSF. And there is a really wonderful and beautiful model um, with the Segorte Land Trust that is, I believe, uh, in part uh, led by uh, Ms. Karina Gould, who is part of the Chichenio Karkin uh, Ohlone community. And so in terms of services that the MRC and the Multicultural Research Center offers for indigenous uh, individuals and indigenous students, I'll say the MRC is student centric and student facing. And one of the things that we do for all students um, is particularly in our collaborations with our student diversity RCOs. And so annually during um, all sort of um, uh, diversity heritage and awareness months, we connect with student leaders of different organizations to bring together and pool um, energy and resources so that that can be interprofessional collaboration and also um, um, more of a, of a university-wide um, sort of um, visibility as well. Um, particularly for uh, Indigenous communities, um, we uh, have hosted a number of different events. Um, the RCOs that are rooted in indigenous communities include the Native American Health Alliance, which historically was a staff organization, um, and that leadership has ebb and flowed, um, but we continue to maintain uh, its presence and its history and in its acknowledgement, especially for uh, past contributors and past elders who have retired from our UCSF community, um, specifically Sandy Canchola. And um, most recently within the student community, uh, they formed an organization called um, ANAMS, or the uh, uh, Native American uh, Medical Student Health Alliance. Um, and so there's an opportunity to connect in with students there. Uh, but with regards to events and activities, we have uh, done the sunrise ceremony um, and other corn indigenous events, inviting elders, singers, performers, and others to come forward. And so if there's ever an, an idea or a need across any community, I would encourage you to reach out to the MRC and specifically our assistant director, Melissa Bautista. You don't have to be rooted in a student RCO, um, but that is one of the ways that we um, always effectively collaborate and connect together. Um, there was a question about working in collaboration with ODO across the different audiences, and then also whether or not students are involved in the committees and recommendations. Uh, Tiff, you might be able to speak a little bit more uh, to that if you would like to, otherwise I can keep going. Uh, Cause I think that the questions bring out uh, important kind of discussion points. Um, so I'm gonna hold on that sort of involvement and participation tip because I, I believe that you, you can speak more clearly to that. And I also know that in terms of um, uh, initiatives and sort of some of that ramp up in terms of who has a seat at the table, who's included in the table, um, it, it's always a both and process, which is um, the process of collaboration and, and voice collecting um, is very, very intentional but also requires a particular uh, process of going into different communities, gathering uh, voices, um, gathering insights, and collecting that information and distilling that information 
into a way that can drive organizational change. And so there's many questions in here that I that I want to address in the spirit of like targeting universalism. And so that's a point that I that I really, really, really believe is important in our diversity work, uh, because when we open up the inclusive diversity umbrella, uh, it is important that we recognize and that when we hear a term that is has been positioned in our vocabulary to do its best to recognize many individuals who come from lived experiences that are historically resilient and nature, um, that it is an inclusive effort. Uh, however, there is um, an important uh, sort of other side of that coin, which is that we also need to be able to create targeted strategies to address systemic differences that, that occur for different communities. Um, because the lived experiences and the operation of different forms of harm, oppression, uh, et cetera, are not exactly the same. So universal strategies um, can be appropriate at times and targeted strategies that actually create differences for our most marginalized community members um, may be most effective at addressing and bringing individuals into a place of equality, right? Um, but there's more of an opportunity to think through who are our policies centered around? Who do they work for and who do they not work for? And so there's a, there's a, there's a moment of being critically intentional about that and then redesigning and sort of reimagining. Um, so I think I hope that speaks to sort of the, the systemic and not long overdue and also about the pieces of policy changes. As a large institution, we have policies that go everywhere across our core areas of service and audiences, whether they are patient centered or uh, community centered versus student centered versus staff centered versus faculty centered. And so if we think about even the term policy, part of it is also examining where does it show up within across the different communities. Our trainings are, 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 are an important process of awareness raising um, and getting people on up to, to speed. And so in some ways, I, I think Tiffany and I think, and, and in many ways, uh, the collective community believes, you know, for a while we had the the um, the pride values, and so it was an an adaptation of understanding as a very large institution, as a very large community. How do we have a collective understanding of what our values are? And so, long term, even in research, there is a little bit of back and forth about the efficacy of mandatory versus voluntary. And what we know is that we have to do again. I'm a psychologist, and we give it to you both and, right? Um, because there are critical places where everyone needs to have a standard of information. And we strongly believe, and it's come for a while, that um, diversity efforts have been a part of that, right? Um, and they're not just voluntary. So, so moving the conversation and moving uh, diversity foundations into a mandatory uh, element was an effort to set a shared com common language, a shared dialogue, and a shared understanding for everyone in our community, regardless of points of entry, that we are all contributing to a climate, and it's all our collective responsibility to ensure and, and to support that climate of inclusion. So I hope that some of that uh, addresses those concerns. I did just want to just kind of put that out there, uh, just because I saw that the, the chat was kind of kind of coming up, and I, I didn't want to just leave y'all hanging. Um, and I'm getting a, a a doom and gloom message on my computer. Uh, so before before in the event that that I have one of those uh, hard restarts from from Apple, let me just pivot really quickly to. Um, what I believe are opportunities for both individual and collective transformation and growth. Um, some may call it in the spirit of allyship, right? Um, that outside of our lived experiences as a community, we are responsible to one another. Not necessarily responsible for, but we are responsible to one another. So not only how do we show up for ourselves um, and honor the places and the lived experiences that we have and where we come from, but how do we show up for one another? And so in the context of, of equity and inclusion and specifically anti-racism at the individual level, uh, there is a ask and an opportunity for critical self-reflection, learning and growth. And so it is to say, to do some individual assessment, to say, where do I, what do I know? What do I need to know more about? 
what do I know, but what can I learn more about, right? And also, what am I passionate about? Uh, I think that that's an, that's an important place too. And where is my opportunity for contribution? And this gets back to, is it mandatory, not mandatory? Is it voluntary or not? And so who participates in these initiatives uh, is really, really important. And so I do believe that if we can distill down into different teams and groups, and just like being invited to be with you all in the School of Pharmacy today, it's an opportunity to say who is in your community, who is actively participating in this work, and who has opted out. And if you have individually opted out uh, because you feel like, man, I don't know how to get in the, I don't know how to contribute. I don't know where I could lend a hand. Um, it is an opportunity to push yourself and to challenge yourself, right? If you have an additional either voluntold or actually an assumed title of manager or leader, there is no opting out. And I'm here to tell you that. And so in terms of the accountability and the action steps that does happen at a, at a stakeholder level, and sometimes folks across the organization may not be able to see all of those things. Um, but our leadership is, is held accountable in terms of uh, the requirement to have more transparency about initiatives and about actions. And then there's an intersecting point, right? So you're an individual, but you're all embedded in different communities teams, small groups. And so it's also how do we practice? How do we engage in, in the embodiment of whether it's anti-racism or uh, equity, inclusion, and belonging? And so it's a, 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 an ask for us to be a little bit more transparent and honest about how we show up with one another, how we engage in an, and demonstrate aspects of power and privilege, and how we can shift our everyday practices, whether it's from meeting and greeting one another, to how we conduct our meetings, to how we center different voices in a room. Uh, all of that makes a big difference, and it really does add up uh, stepwise into a collective institutional experience of change. So I'm going to stop there um, and pause there and just kind of turn it back to Dr. Yeomans and others. If there are sort of highlights or things that you want to dialogue and talk about, uh, we will be here with you all. Um, but I'm just being very transparent. I'm getting a, a doom and gloom message on my computer, so I might have to re-log back on. Well, thank you, Dr. Hill, and thank you, Tiffany, um, for uh, sharing your expertise um, for what the campus is doing. It's a lot to take in but the work is huge. And I think we're all still learning, um, but I do feel that there's a culture on campus that even 10 years ago, we didn't have because we weren't even talking about these issues. Um, so uh, we have questions and I think Levi is going to moderate that. And then people uh, can continue to put questions in the chat um, and we'll try to address them as best we can. So Levi, because we still have some time, go ahead. All right, so Lamisha, I think you, you may have answered this in part, um, but Chase Webb asked, how can ODO more effectively, effectively work together um, with what I think uh, he was saying with the grad division and with regards to learner success? Absolutely. So I think that we are doing getting better at figuring out how to be multidisciplinary and interprofessional and also hold capacity um, for, for having larger seats at these tables. And I think virtually being virtual uh, has expanded uh, our ability. Um, and I know Chase, you probably know better than anyone, the ways in which our institution is sort of constructed. Um, I like to say, we, I joke that we're an adult Montessori school, right? So we are very matrix, we're very siloed. Um, there can be a benefit to that uh, for core units and different um, departments, teams, um, campus programs having the ability to have agency over how they operate, right? So there's a benefit to that. And the cost is, and the challenge then that that creates is, then how do we build a bridge that brings us all together seamlessly? And that I think is a place where we've, that we have really struggled. And so with regards to not just the anti-racism initiative, but other places of, of getting students more engaged and building those bridges of connections, um, whether it's between the resource centers or the LGBT center, the multicultural resource center, the embedding in student diversity organizations, and us making an effort to try to 
tie those connections across the different school and academic pro programs. And then it is for also our leadership in the different schools and programs who are embedded in the different tables and have seats at those tables to think thoughtfully of where uh, folks can have an opportunity to participate and contribute. And we wanna be mindful about that contribution and about that task and about that ask. Um, because I believe that in the past, UCSF was a little bit more uh, inclined to ask and invite students to participate. And now there's a little bit more realization to and recognition of the tax and some of the effort and the energy and the cost of that. And so then what does that honor uh, and compensation look like? Uh, if that is going to be put on students. And so I think sometimes just even in building the making the table larger, sometimes it does start and, and might feel a little bit insular. And it's not meant to be exclusive or exclusionary. Uh, but it also is, a, is an effort to try to ramp something up and, and get to a place of launch so that it can grow. Uh, and so that we're not taxing people, overtaxing and overworking and stressing people with the minutia. Uh, in sort of the, the planning and the design and the building phases. But I'll definitely raise that question. And I think uh, Dr. Yeomans and others um, are positioned in some of these spaces and we can think more thoughtfully about that. Great, so we got a question on whether the slide deck will be available to attendees. So um, the school normally does post a recording of this entire presentation with a transcript. So the slides will be available in a video in that way. Um, Lamisha, will the slides be available as a PowerPoint possibly or? Yeah, I think that um, all the things that we've shared are, are embedded in other spaces that are visible. So we're happy to PDF that down so you can post the link as well. Wonderful. Um, so Chase also asked whether students are involved in curriculum changes. Um, I don't know, Lamisha, if you wanna address that generally. No, I'm gonna, or... I might wanna pass that over to That's Dr. Yeah, no. Not, a, not a problem. No, thank, I'm happy to answer that question. Thank you, Chase. Uh, I'll just remind um, everyone that back in December, we received uh, a report from a task force that was convened by the then Dean Joe Guglielmo uh, to come up with some recommendations for an anti-racist curriculum. And it was composed of faculty, staff, and students. And so we have received um, those recommendations and those recommendations uh, that relate to the curriculum specifically were passed on to our curriculum uh, committee that is composed of faculty and students. Um, in addition to that, even prior to the task force, uh, Dr. Stephanie Shaw and Dr. Rupa Tuan have developed and are still developing a health equity uh, curriculum that runs parallel with the curriculum, the, the core curriculum. And um, they have implemented um, topics across the themes in the second year and, and are in the process of developing something for the first year. And they have used um, student interns to help with that. So it's a small thing. They do talk about issues of racism. It's not necessarily an anti-racist curriculum in the truest sense. And we're still struggling with what that really means and what that looks like. Um, but we are making um, increments and whatever we do in the curriculum, students are always involved. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yeomans. Yeah, and I, and I definitely know that there is, and this is also a place where we can leverage one another um, because, you know, within all of our different programs, right, and siloed and matrix, however you want to say it, we can say it nicely and we can see the benefit to it. Um, but not only is the challenge coming up around building connectedness, um, there is a real challenge around equity. And in terms of the access to resources or just the person power to drive change. Uh, and there's many places in our organization where we can go much farther if we go together, right? And I think- I'd like to add that, you know, ODO and the DEI Executive Leadership Council, we are looking for input from students and we'd like to know how you'd like to be involved. And, you know, you can always, think of ways or, or raise that questions to ODO to start from there. We'd love to hear from you. We are trying to figure that out too. That questions have been coming up, how to best engage students. We understand that, you know, in addition to dismantling racism, you have a whole lot of work to do, schoolwork to do. So how is best way for you to participate? So by all means, let us know what is best for you and um, your colleagues. 
All right, so I'm going to combine two related questions here. Um, one, are there consequences for faculty not doing some of these trainings? Um, Chase one, thought that they were required. And a similar question is, um, how do we get faculty more involved in these efforts? Um, if there aren't consequences or if it isn't a, an expectation from leadership, how can we ensure that faculty are involved? I don't know, Sharon, maybe you can oh, speak hello. to that. So the first part about the consequences for faculty not doing that, I, I'm, I'm not aware of any. So, so I don't know, but it is strongly um, encouraged and it doesn't take that long, but, um, but that may be coming down, down the pike and we might have to you know, ask Renee Shop what that is, but um, I'm not aware of any specific consequences. Um, in terms of getting um, faculty more involved, in fact, the whole campus, because it was supposed to be re required for everyone, um, st students and staff to take the training, um, is, is always an ongoing process um, because it's not just flipping through a bunch of slides and answering some questions, but it's a real sort of commitment that I want to learn better. I want to learn more so I can do better and help change the culture. So, you know, one of the things that the school did um, under the leadership of Joe Guglielmo was for, uh, and it's not about anti-racist training, but it was to get people's commitment to do work around DEI. And so for faculty who are going up for promotion, they have to submit a statement um, of their DEI contributions. And it can be anything. And we help faculty get give um, examples because sometimes it's hard to think if it's not a direct uh, connection. So it's little things like that. And, you know, hopefully when we get the new dean, there'll be a strategy to try to help each other do this work because it, it is hard work. Um, but if we're committed to having an inclusive and equitable culture, we all have to do our part and we all have to help each other because there are people who are further along the continuum than others. We don't want to want to sit in judgment, but how can we help? And sometimes the smallest thing that you do can go a long way until it becomes just part, a real part of just our natural way of doing business um, at the university. I, I just wanted to add on to what Sharon said, that we were one, us and School of Nursing were the only ones to require that each and every faculty member had a statement of diversity inclusion in their CV. And, and not just as sort of a requirement, right? but also for them to sort of be thinking about it and hopefully increase the awareness. And, and furthermore, we actually acknowledge anybody that goes above and beyond that was a champion of DEI and actually use that as a basis for an acceleration or a promotion. So I think there was some tangible benefits rather than looking at it as a stick, we're trying to provide it more as a carrot. And, uh, and my, my, I have a quick question though for Lamisha and Tiffany, if you don't mind, Levi. And it's something I was thinking about as the interim dean is that I've heard, well, maybe we should develop an actual strategic plan school-wide to address DEI and anti-racism. And I was just curious from your standpoint, Lamisha and Tiffany, have you guys seen any schools actually compile something like that? Does, your, does ODO help assist in that? You know, I was just thinking about the feasibility, what are reasonable targets? and plans. And so trying to make a, a very yeah. tangible follow up to a lot of these awareness discussions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it is um, it is common. I, I'm going to joke to the person who's joking with me about best practices. It is a best practice. Um, and part of that is an opportunity for each school program department um, to identify what are their growth areas, what are the unique initiatives that they're working on across, again, their areas of service, uh, their core areas of work, and think about what's the, what's the tangible next step. So it's, it's, um, it's really deeply uh, a, a desire to get people from having diversity be the thing that you add on at the end, right? Oftentimes it's the thing that we add on, we tack it on at the end. So we've done everything, everything, you know, whether it's the budget, whether it's the hiring, whether it is, um, you know, our recruitment efforts, whether it is our curriculum design and our slide decks, rather than put it at the end 
embedded in everything that we do. And so you're absolutely right that this will require every major sort of campus entity department to think broadly about that big picture, what does it look like? And then be able to distill it into the different core areas of units and services so that it shows up as a root and as a foundation that can bring life to something larger and bigger collectively. And it's something that we've talked about with yeah. in terms of the North Star um, and sort of the A3 models. And then within the School of Medicine, there is an annual requirement for a for all departments to submit their um, diversity report, action report every year. Mm -hmm. But as far as the strategic plan, um, you know, what you're looking for, the School of Medicine, of course, they have abundance of resources, but they really make it a, a comprehensive plan. And I think it could be a good model to address different areas and focus groups on building out to me, in my opinion, infrastructure to do the work. You know, um, a lot of times we talk about work we got to do, and we're recognizing that in the anti racism initiative as well is that, yes, we're doing a lot of work. There's a lot of different areas that need to be addressed, but do we really have ongoing resources mm -hmm. and support to build out the infrastructure to continue and sustain the work? Mm -hmm. And that strategic plan is much needed not only within the school, but within the whole university as well. And I think, you know, certainly School of Medicine has a lot of resources put in to build that infrastructure, but I think it's a good model to, to see is that these are the areas in addressing students, in staff learning, you know, in faculty development. And I think that is a, a, it's a good plan moving forward for school to focus on, as well as connecting that to the anti-racism initiative infrastructure and you know the chancellor's mission in terms of putting equity and inclusion as a priority in these pillars. Mm -hmm. So we have a handful of questions that seem to revolve around hiring practices. Mm -hmm. um, so any of the panelists feel free to, to jump in. One of them is asking about how um, we can make UCSF a more diverse workforce. Mm -hmm. um, another one is asking about the nature of um, these DEI requirements in the applications for faculty, as well as for their advancement to tenure. Mm -hmm. um, and then perhaps as a last one, how do we balance this with overall trying to hire the best people who might not be BIPOC or underrepresented? So it's a bunch of different ones, but just in the realm of hiring, um, how can we reconcile these things? Yeah, I, I'll, I'm happy to kick that off. Um, and um, y'all can also add uh, more specifics on the faculty piece. So, so first part, I, I strongly believe we need to be more transparent. Um, our data is public. Um, we do share the data every year, whether it's from HR or even from our, from our academic uh, appointments to our um, student enrollment. It's public information, um, but I don't think that, I think that we could do better about uh, keeping an eye and being transparent in it, even these, in these conversations. So that's why I'm telling you, I'm not here to sugarcoat it. We can be doing much, much better um, across the board in terms of our faculty, our students, our trainees, et cetera. In terms of efforts, there are a lot of efforts. <laughs> I'm just gonna highlight a couple of, of what I think are not only the potential for, but also some of the most um, impactful uh, initiatives. I'll start with the Anchor Institution, um, which is an effort to recognize that UCSF has the, not only the ability to, but also the responsibility to uh, serve as an anchor for the Bay Area, uh, whether it is in employment, but also with, with services and access to health and safety. So the Anchor Institution has a critical pillar around uh, employment and recruitment and hiring. Um, and there are a number of, of different initiatives that are embedded to create 
more accessibility for staff employment at UCSF, uh, whether that is um, a training and certification programs like the, like the Catalyst program, um, to I just saw most recently um, an opportunity uh, to launch a program for clinical research coordinators, which I think is probably one of the most critical points of entry and opportunity because of the number of positions that exist, but the opportunity to serve a really broad spectrum of folks including uh, learners, uh, particularly learners from different backgrounds to be able to access the health science institution, learn more about their next steps for their career development trajectory and access mentorship and support to be able to launch into um, that, that career band. It also is a point of opportunity and growth for, for folks not of, of whether you're non-traditionally aged or who want a different reset in their career. So uh, our clinical research coordinators and their other points in the institution, they're actually really, really pivotal entry points. And between Corey Jackson, Michael Jones, Nancy Duranto, I'll just name a few folks within our HR system in partnership with Jeff Chu, who are really looking critically um, at these certain junctures, particularly for our staff members. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I want to add on to that work. There, you know, that group that sort of Labisha mentioned is there is a work group uh, on workforce disparities that's been going on for years, led by Jeff Chu and Dr. Rene Navarro. And one of their work is focused on, as I mentioned, in, in the anti-racism initiative is the advancing um, excellence in staff recruitment. And itself, um, I wouldn't say it's policies, but new processes developed um, or enhanced to guide the hiring diversity. Um, and from the moment that applications are developed, how job descriptions are developed and the language that you put in all the way down to the selection process and how to mitigate unconscious bias. And this is why we have the staff equity advisors. We have a diversity talent strategist to support the sort of processes that we have identified as best practices for diversity hiring. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, you know, like the toolkit and the hiring guide that is available for anybody can look at and understand the transparency and the standardized process that's been in place so that you yourself can be educated in how to, whether you're a hiring manager or part of the search committee can understand that, you know, sometimes you're looking at data and then specific groups that you need to vote target on to diversify, not just within your department, but within the role in the entire university. Mm -hmm. So there's so many different things. And I just answered Chase in the um, Q and A is that we do have uh, rubrics to, um, evaluate not the faculty diversity statements as well as staff diversity statement that we um, that they submit. So all of these processes and all of these procedures uh, in place in the hiring process are to support uh, diversification and fairness and transparency in the whole process. Mm -hmm. Great. And I was wondering, uh, maybe Sharon, um, do you have anything to, to say with regard to the tenure process in particular? Um, whether that is beginning to account for participation in DEI initiatives. You mean in terms of the faculty DEI statement submissions of that? So I think the question is more aimed at the advancement of faculty after they've been hired. Oh, the advancement of faculty after they've been hired. Well, a lot of work has been done. And Tom, actually, you probably could speak to this better because you were our Associate Dean of Faculty um, Academic Affairs and working with CAP. That's a bit of a comp, but I would say that the campus committee that makes the decisions on tenure have really kind of turned the corner and value what they see with DEI. But Tom, you can probably speak more to that. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, we are only one of two schools that actually require a statement and address this issue in their curriculum vitae when they're being you know, up for uh, either a merit or a promotion or any sort of academic action. By the way, tenure is only one that we have two of our basic research uh, departments have basically ladder rank faculty that are tenured. However, our other department, one of our biggest departments, clinical pharmacy only has one ladder rank faculty. So uh, all the other series don't have tenure. So just to clarify that. And, and, and as I mentioned before, we look at you know, this issue is not so much a stick, but a carrot. 
that if it's there and it's, 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 it's adequate, they can move forward based on the other criteria of review. However, if they've done something exceptional, like we've had some of our faculty members be awarded like the Chancellor's Award for Diversity. And that was, again, you know, could be used as justification for being accelerated. And so I think, you know, we keep an eye on that. Uh, I have reviewed these statements over the past eight years when I was Associate Dean of Academic Affairs. And before they weren't very substantive. And I think we're moving more in the direction where people are being more thoughtful about it and about, you know, something that seems to be it's a much more tangible way in which they're contributing to it. And, and I think the first phase of it was is just to make people aware. And a lot of people didn't understand what really constituted, you know, something that they were doing that really, uh, you know, was contributing in this particular area that was substantive. And we added on to advance. There's a little rollover scroll that gives you examples of DEI. And there was a guideline that was put forth by the campus that we distributed to all of our faculty. So I, and all in all, I got to tell you, I've been very happy and satisfied with the direction that faculty have taken in terms of constant, you know, doing this, being more aware of it and actually putting a big effort into it. And furthermore, the chair's letter that goes on top of it also addresses DEI issues on each and every faculty member in terms of when they're up for an academic action. And so this is further acknowledged and recognized or expounded upon by the department chair. So hopefully that answers your question, but I think it's become an integral part of, you know, academic advancement and the way that we review each and every faculty member. Yeah. And I think it's become much more transparent and under Renee's leadership, they got the um, faculty manual change so that those things could be taken into consideration because the flip side is that faculty who do a lot of this work previously would be sacrificed or come up short because those activities, even if you disseminated in the literature, were not necessarily valued as much as our traditional ways in which we do research and patient care, et cetera. So now that's being put on the same uh, level as all other faculty activities. So that's a good thing so that you're not unintentionally punished for doing this work. Uh, just an, another thing is that I also had to lead what we call the faculty salary equity review. So we look at if there's any bias and discrimination in terms of faculty salaries based on gender, but also underrepresented minorities to make sure that they are being treated equally in terms of faculty salaries and, and that the way that they're, uh, you know, provided in terms of their a negotiable salary and their standard salary. Uh, by the way, between the previous review, which was like two, three years before, and the current review that we did, we have doubled our underrepresented minority faculty. We're not where I think we should be optimally, but we're certainly moving in the right direction. So I'm very pleased about that. But keep in mind, as you know, faculty get senior faculty here, and it sometimes takes many decades before you see turnover. We have small amounts of turnover. The other thing that we grapple with as a school, as a small school, is that trying to populate committees with, you know, diverse, you know, representation. We just have, you know, and we have a very small number of underrepresented minorities. And it's actually, to some extent, unfair to them that they've got to populate every committee. And so that's something that we struggle with, frankly, as opposed to something like the School of Medicine, which has a huge number of underrepresented minorities in which they can provide that diversity in terms of populating all their committees. So, you know, there, there are certain things that we have challenges that we have to deal with. And the other thing that, that has always has concerned me is our student population. And uh, Sharon has, sh has shared a report on the workforce in terms of various professions, healthcare professions, the pipeline, as well as, you know, what we're graduating. And I got to tell you, one of the areas also for me that pharmacy in particular does a very poor job in terms of Hispanics, bringing Hispanics into the profession. And so I think one of the high priorities that we need to do is what can we do to enhance our outreach and hopefully bring in, you know, a diverse student population that looks similar to the population that they serve. And I got, that's a tremendous challenge, I know. Uh, but again, that's something that we really are going to need to strive for in the coming years. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. Um, so the last question that I think would be kind of nice to land on is a little bit more abstract and about how we do business in general. Um, and it is, if race is a social construct, why are we using it to evaluate our health enterprise? Make it make sense. Um, this you. is a hard question, but can any of you address it? Yeah, I think this is a perfect closing question. Um, and again, in the spirit of both and, race is a social construct and it continues to have um, real, real impacts on people's lives. And as we are growing in our awareness of how it operates, um, both socially, economically, uh, structurally, legally, and getting more honest about the history and the past of that, uh, we can't necessarily uh, sort of, um, I'll just say divorce ourselves from it entirely, right? And I think that there have been efforts to just move forward, right? Um, without acknowledging the places in which it has caused great impact and specifically um, great harm, but also great um, places of unrecognized and unaddressed advantages as well. So we have to be uh, more intentional and more open to those conversations and have a critical lens on the function of the construct of race. While we elevate our, I would say our heart-centered awareness to the places where we can celebrate our, our lived experiences from our various cultural backgrounds and identities, um, but also celebrate the places where we have commonalities and where we can, can, we can operate and grow together. Mm -hmm. And so, so with that, I, I, I think that that's really the spirit of anti-racism, right? Um, it, is, it is not to just sort of uh, ignore that race is present, but it is actively uh, saying that there's an opportunity to address how do we acknowledge the ways that racism shows up in our policies and what are we actively doing to address it? And that is the process of being anti-racist. So with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Tiffany for our final question, and then we will say our goodbyes to you all. And actually, I just wanted to, Eric, can you put that slide up real fast before Tiffany ends? Um, I just wanted to announce that the School of Pharmacy now does have a landing page um, describing DEI efforts, um, as well as upcoming events um, and successes, and also places to submit feedback. So please visit this page. Um, it will evolve over time, um, but we're very happy that we can now share this with the community. Um, also, in about a month, there will be the Chancellor's Annual Leadership Forum on Diversity and Inclusion. So keep your eyes on your inboxes in the coming weeks for the invite for that event. Um, and with that, uh, Tiffany, if you want to put up the final poll question. Yes, thanks for indulging me. This will, we want to know what you will do next mm -hmm. um, after this presentation. So um, without further ado, I put the link to uh, the chat so you can go on and give your answer. And thanks so much for coming today. As an individual, what are your next steps in DEI and anti-racism? Oh, wow. Um, are you seeing, oh, sorry. Organization. All right, so I think we're out of time. So I just want to thank again our presenters, Tiffany and Lamisha, and thanks to, to Sharon and Tom for participating and thank you all for attending. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, thank you Levi and Eric, thank you. And Emma and Liana and Lisa Duca, thank you very much. Thank you all as well. <laughs>